There are few more dramatic moments than beloved characters dying before our eyes. The awesome TV series that kept us riveted throughout the 2010s often employed the device of making us wonder just which bucket would be kicked. Here are the TV deaths from the past decade we're still mourning. It's no easy feat to pick the death that rattled fans the most throughout Game of Thrones' eight-season run. This was, after all, a series in which some beloved fan-favorite characters were dropping like flies, letting the audience know that no one was safe. We're pretty sure we can pin it down, though. Even though there's some stiff competition, it probably won't surprise you that our pick for the most brutal send-off on Thrones came during the infamous Season 3 episode, The Reigns of Castamere. That's right, it's the Red Wedding, which might just be the single worst wedding reception of all time. As the result of a conspiracy between Walder Frey and Tywin Lannister, King Rob Stark, his wife Talisa, Rob's mother Kat, and, well, pretty much all of the rest of the Starks met a grisly fate when they should have been doing the cha-cha slide. The first family of Winterfell, their entire army of 15,000 soldiers, and even their pet Direwolf are ambushed and massacred at the wedding of Edmure Tully. The ostensible reason is that House Stark broke a marriage pact with House Frey. The real reason is, of course, far more politically devious, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is that pregnant Queen Talisa had just told King Rob what she wanted to name their baby, moments before both she and said unborn child are dispatched in a truly horrifying manner. Even with all of the other carnage that gave the Red Wedding its name, Talisa's stands out for sheer brutality. If you're a Thrones fan, you already know. If not, allow us to inform you that everything you've heard about this series is true. And if you stayed away because you didn't want to see the violence, that was probably for the best. Of all the characters on Breaking Bad, Hank Schrader, the DEA agent played by Dean Norris, whose brother-in-law just happens to be the meth king of New Mexico, could be the most frustrating. He was a genuinely good guy, but he could be bullheaded, stubborn, and prone to lashing out at those around him, but generally with good reason. He always seemed to be right on the cusp of discovering Walter White's secret, and the constant whispering of his gut telling him so had to just drive him nuts. His death came in what many consider to be the finest episode of the series overall, and it's third to last, Ozymandias. That's when everything starts to come crashing down around Walter, and everyone close to him pays the price. Tricked by former partner Jesse into driving out to the remote spot in the desert where his money is buried, Walter panics when the kid shows up with Hank and his partner Gomez. Walt makes the fatal error of calling new associate Jack and his neo-Nazi gang to assist, and they do, by way of a hail of bullets. With Gomez dead and Jesse captured, Jack forces Walter to plead for Hank's life, even as Hank knows that his fate is sealed. You're too stupid to see. He made up his mind ten minutes ago. One gunshot and one brilliant reaction from Brian Cranston was all it took to break our hearts and the remainder of the series didn't play any nicer. The first season of Netflix's Stranger Things was a revelation, but as it was heavily inspired by the works of Stephen King and every single cool movie we saw from the 80s, its legion of viewers probably didn't think it was capable of throwing us many curveballs. We knew that Joyce was right about the disappearance of her son Will, and that he was still alive in the Upside Down, an alternate dimension seeping into their town. We knew that the gruff local sheriff would eventually figure this out and assist in Will's rescue. We knew that Will's buddies, especially Mike and the mysterious and powerful Eleven, would defeat the monstrous Demogorgon. But we were pretty sure that Barb, the best friend of Mike's sister Nancy, was getting set up to be a major supporting character who would complicate Nancy and Steve's new romance. It turned out we got that one pretty definitively wrong. Barb getting sucked into the Upside Down in just the second episode was a major shock. We even held out hope that she'd make a surprise return, right up until the moment when Eleven found Barb's body in the Upside Down, being used as an incubator for some gross slug things. The only good news here is that Will didn't suffer the same fate, but he had plenty of problems of his own. Way to string us along, Stranger Things! Even if you never read the comics, you knew something bad was going to go down the moment Rick Grimes ordered the preemptive strike on the supposedly tiny Savior Gang near the end of the sixth season of The Walking Dead. If you had read the comics, you knew exactly what was likely to happen, and you may have stopped watching the show around this time just to save yourself the trauma. 
turned out there were a lot more of the saviors than Rick thought, and that their leader was a smiling psychopath named Negan, who carried a baseball bat wrapped in barbed wire, and had very little patience for anyone who crossed him. After Rick's ill-fated attempt to take out his gang, Negan responded with some head-bashing fury. You don't really think that you were going to get through this without being punished now, did you? With Rick and company held captive, the noble Abraham was the first to get his head used for batting practice, and for a brief moment, we all entertained the notion that the beloved Glenn would escape his cruel fate from the comics. After all, his death had been teased earlier in the season, only to lead to a miraculous return. This time, there was no miracle, and there would be no return. Glenn was taken down in front of not just his friends, but his girlfriend Maggie, who was carrying his unborn child. If anything, Glenn's execution on the show was even more gruesome and heartrending than it was in print, and one of the most vicious to ever be seen on the show. And in case that wasn't enough, the show added insult to head bashing by making us wait for months between seasons 6 and 7 for this brutal resolution. BoJack Horseman really is one of the funniest shows out there, but it's always been totally, enthusiastically willing to just wind up and sock viewers right in the gut with some devastatingly emotional storytelling. Perhaps the series' most brutal moment came near the end of Season 3, in an episode appropriately titled, That's Too Much, Man! That was not only the catchphrase used by Sarah Lynn, BoJack's old co-star on the 90s TV show Horsin' Around, it was a pretty apt description of the episode itself. As Sarah Lynn prepares to celebrate nine months of sobriety, the troubled former child star gets a call from Bojack asking if she wants to party. Feeling like he has nothing left to live for, he suggests the two longtime friends go on what he calls an epic bender. Of course, she agrees, and hilarious hijinks ensue as Bojack attempts and utterly fails to make amends to everyone he's harmed while the pair are absolutely wasted for the next… well, it's not really clear how long it goes on. It's tough to figure out because they keep blacking out, but it feels like months. After going through a truckload of pills, booze, and heroin, the duo finally end up at a planetarium, and while they take in the show, Bojack appears to reach some kind of zen mind state, coming to a realization about his place in the universe. The only thing that matters is right now. This moment. This one spectacular moment we are sharing together. Right, Sarah Lynn? She doesn't answer. While Bojack was coming to his epiphany, Sarah Lynn was passing away from an overdose, with Bojack being, at the very least, partly responsible. Regular viewers of Sons of Anarchy were used to watching characters meet violent and shocking fates, but perhaps none was quite so emotional as that of Harry Winston, also known as Opie, the best friend of main character Jax Teller. After the shooting of Clay near the end of Season 4, events spiral out of control, leaving the daughter of feared gangster Damon Pope dead by the hand of one of the motorcycle club's top members, Tig. A group of bikers that includes Jax and Opie end up in jail, and Pope demands a meaty cut of the Sons of Anarchy's profits for the death of his daughter. Oh, and he also wants revenge. An incident is staged in which one of the four will have to deck a guard and willingly take a beating that will end his life, and Jax appears willing to be the one. But at the last minute, Opie steps up to give new meaning to the phrase, take one for the team. The guards let other inmates work him over all the way to the end, right in front of Jax, who is powerless in more ways than one to do anything about it. Some tough choices are made by the creative minds behind our favorite series, but other choices are made for them by real life. Such was the case with Riverdale's Fred Andrews, whose fate came as the result of a real-life tragedy. Fred was the father of main character Archie Andrews, and a plum late career role for Luke Perry, who became a fan favorite on the series after he dusted off the teen drama skills he'd honed many years earlier on Beverly Hills 90210. Perry suffered a massive stroke midway through the production of Riverdale's third season, and he hung on for a week before passing away. His stunned and saddened castmates carried on, and the show's writers crafted a genuinely touching farewell a fourth-season premiere in which Fred was given a valiant, heroic death. He struck down by a hit-and-run driver after pushing a woman, played by his 90210 co-star Shannon Doherty, out of the way of the speeding vehicle. Near the episode's conclusion, he's given a tear-jerking eulogy by his son that has a very different tone from the show's usual pulpy melodrama. It hurts me that I never got to say goodbye. That I won't get to see him again or talk to him. 
It was a fitting send-off for the beloved actor, and not only did the episode carry a dedication to him at its end, but all future ones will have that dedication as well. The first season of Netflix's 13 Reasons Why was a measured, intense trek toward a tragedy that we all knew was coming. It was baked into the show's premise, which saw ostracized teenager Hannah Baker, played by Katherine Langford, leave behind a series of audio cassettes for her friends and acquaintances, detailing each one's part in her decision to end her own life. For 12 episodes, we wondered how the series would handle the actual event, and when the final episode of the season answered the question, we immediately wished it hadn't. Hannah's death was initially presented unflinchingly, harrowingly, and without looking away. Thanks to Langford's incredible acting, the scene was so realistic, sad, and terrifying that the series immediately came under scrutiny for potentially posing a threat to the mental health of troubled viewers. The series has carried on for two more seasons and will soon get a fourth and final outing, all dealing with the aftermath of Hannah's death. But that one three-minute scene has continued to provoke controversy, to the point that Netflix heavily edited it in advance of the season three premiere. The actual act is no longer depicted. If only fans could remove the scene from their brains as easily as Netflix removed it from its servers. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK, 1-800-273-8255.